Hello ICS Chiropractors, my name is Tim Bertelsman and together we're going to spend the next three and a half hours talking about some of the most common lower extremity conditions that you and I see in practice. We'll talk about greater trochanteric pain syndrome or hip bursitis. We'll talk about iliotibial band syndrome. We'll talk about knee osteoarthritis, the whole continuum of knee osteoarthritis going from patellofemoral pain syndrome to degeneration. We'll discuss shin splints and we'll also talk about things like plantar fasciitis and tarsal tunnel syndrome. So really everything from the belt downward. We'll talk about the best practice assessment, management, and the recipes that you can give your patients to help speed their recovery. These are things that you and I see on a regular basis and I hope that I'm able to share some things with you today that enhance your knowledge. Now one thing is that I don't have all the answers. So even though we're virtual, I'd love your input. If you have input about anything that I talk about, email me, tim at chiroup.com, or just text it during the presentation. You can jump into the chat box and I'll be there to answer those questions and hopefully clarify anything I didn't get straight the first time. I don't know about you, but I've noticed things have been a little different over the last 18 months or so. That there's a whole lot more mask wearing going on and there's a lot of people laying around on couches. We've got bubbles outside restaurants, especially in downtown Chicago. We've got a whole bunch of people who are working from home and we're using Zoom like we've never used before. Yes, it's a different world and hopefully that's a temporary process. But one thing that's changing that's not temporary is the future of healthcare. That in the past we had a simple process that as a provider we performed a service, we sent that bill to the insurance company or the patient and they paid us. That was a wonderful thing. Well, that's changed because now we've got accountable care organizations and all sorts of managed care in the middle that changes that. Those accountable care organizations are there for three purposes. Number one, to make sure that the patient gets better as quickly as possible. Number two, that that happens at a high level of patient satisfaction. And number three, that both of those happen at the lowest possible cost. The first two sound good, the third one doesn't sound so great. But what we'll be discussing today is how to achieve those first two which is delivering that care for a great outcome with a happy patient. And if we do that efficiently, we'll be a low cost and we'll stay on the top of the food chain. It's all about value in healthcare, that our value is our V-score, which is divined by the results that we can achieve, divided by the price of a visit and the number of times that we see that patient. Anything that increases the numerator makes us more valuable. Anything that increases the denominator with an increase in cost or an increase in number of times that we see the patient makes us less valuable. So let's get to it. What are we going to discuss today? We'll discuss the structural problems that cause pain, but we'll also discuss the functional problems that delay our patient's recovery. Sometimes those hidden or overlooked issues like foot hyperpronation or hip abductor weakness that are killing our clinical outcomes. It's the reason the patient continues to have problems in spite of our best efforts. So I'll do my best to relay that information to you. I don't have all the answers. I'll look forward to getting your input throughout the talk, but I hope that I'll do my very best to share some information that you can use on Monday morning. So let's get started. The first condition that we'll discuss is FAI, or femoral acetabular impingement. This basically means that there's a mismatch between the acetabulum and the femur. In order for that ball and socket joint to work well, we need a round ball and a round socket. If, e if either of those two are not perfectly spherical, we've got a problem. And that's basically what FAI is, is that one of the two, either the acetabulum or the femoral head, is slightly out of its, its camber, where we've got a, an, either an oblong head or an oblong socket. And when that happens, it no longer has that ball and socket arrangement, and we have a problem. So either one of those, the socket or the ball, can be malshapen. In a normal hip, we have round parts on both of them. If we have cam type FAI, it means that the femoral head has become elongated or egg-shaped. And so now when we abduct or internally rotate that, that femur, we're going to get some impingement on the edge of the acetabulum. The other thing that can happen is a pincer type impingement. And in this case, the femoral head is fine, but it's the edge of the acetabulum that's causing problems. We used to call this acetabular rim syndrome. And really, this is a relatively new diagnosis that it wasn't until about 1991 that anybody even described this problem. So many of us had not heard about it in our training, but now we're seeing it on MRI reports, we're seeing it on x-ray reports, that the patient has a cam or a pincer type FAI. But what they have most often is both. That mixed FAI, meaning you have both cam and pincer, in 75% of those cases, that's what's going on. 
This is a problem that's pretty common. It affects a big chunk of the population, but it's not always symptomatic. We'll talk about who gets it and how to get rid of it in just a second. But the one way I remember this when I'm looking at radiographic reports is that if we have a pincer type FAI, that means my acetabular rim has become elongated. Imagine that I have long fingernails and now those long fingernails pince or pinch as I'm abducting my, my uh, humor. It's not my humor, it'd be my femur. So that pinch is in there and that's how I remember pincer versus cam, but most of the time it's going to be both. Well, what motion triggers that? It's pretty consistent that it's repetitive flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Things like stepping out of a vehicle or doing the breaststroke, those are types of motions that put that hip into a repeated pinch so that if we have some malshapen femoral head or a malshapen acetabulum, we've got a problem. We've got pinching and we've got pain. A lot of times this is our younger patient, so sometimes this can look a little bit like osteoarthritis, except it's in a 20-year-old population. So when we see somebody who's young and physically active, maybe they've been out of college for a couple of years, they play soccer or racquetball or tennis on the weekends and they get this hip pain, the typical groin crease pain, we're going to be suspecting FAI as opposed to hip osteoarthritis. Most of the time, the symptoms are unilateral. It'll pick one side or the other and not necessarily dominant or non-dominant. Now, the interesting thing is that usually this condition is present bilaterally but symptomatic unilaterally. So again, it's one of those structural problems that we say, is that structure the cause or are there some other functional problems that may be contributing? And I think we'll see the latter in just a second. But this patient comes in with insidious pain. It wasn't a traumatic onset. It was something that just gradually started and it ramped up over time. It's a dull, achy discomfort. And the patient doesn't like to have prolonged periods of sitting, climbing stairs, or the types of activities that put that into a pinch. A lot of times they'll also be limiting their range of motion because of that discomfort. So what are we going to do to assess and manage that? One of the things that we'll talk about repeatedly over the next three and a half hours together is this gray box. And the gray box is our best practice assessment for uh, best practice recipe for the assessment, the management, and then the treatment as far as the home exercises that we can prescribe to the patient. The good news is I'm going to share descriptions and videos of each one of those so that we'll go through them together and we'll know exactly what to do when that next FAI patient comes in. So first for our evaluation, anytime somebody comes in with groin crease pain, usually they'll have the C sign, and the C sign is basically taking your hand, making a C and putting it over the uh, superior to the greater trochanter, and if there's pain in that region or down into the groin crease, we're very suspicious that this is hip pathology. A test that can, can kind of confirm that there's a hip issue is the Faber test, and we're all familiar with Faber test. It's flexion, abduction, and external rotation of the legs. So Dr. Steele's going to move Christie's legs into those positions of flexion, abduction, and external rotation. He'll stabilize her contralateral ASIS and then apply a little bit of a downward pressure. And as he's doing that, he's shearing the capsule. Now Faber test doesn't tell us a whole lot because it's positive in 88% of all hip pathology. So it doesn't matter if you have degeneration, or if you have an acetabular rim issue, if you have a labral tear, it's probably going to light up with a Faber test. Except FAI sometimes doesn't light up with a Faber test. What FAI doesn't like is the Fadir test. Remember, these are the stressors. If we whittle that down, we can see that those stressors turn into Fadir test. So Fadir is taking the patient's leg into flexion, adduction, and internal rotation, just as you see Dr. Steele doing here flexing Christie's hip and knee to 90 degrees plus, moving her leg into internal rotation, and then applying some adduction. And as he does that and applies a little bit of overpressure, somebody with FAI, a young healthy patient, is probably going to complain about that. So remember, the stressors are flexion, adduction, internal rotation, which is basically Fadir test. So we're going to see those movements very pr provocative. This graphic shows kind of how that happens, that when we're moving into flexion and adduction, we're going to get some cam or pincer type impingement. A lot of times we'll see pain on Fadir, but we'll see a negative Faber test. And when we see that, that's one of the 12% of diagnoses that don't uh, light up with a Faber test. So we're very suspicious of a young patient with a positive Fadir and a negative Faber test. The other test that an FAI patient won't like, especially a pincer type FAI patient, is going into extension 
and external rotation. So sometimes this is called the hip posterior impingement sign. And the way that it works is just what we described, taking the patient's knee to 90, moving their hip into extension, and then taking that into some internal and external rotation. When the patient has pain upon passive hip extension and internal or external rotation, we know that there's going to be a high likelihood that they have a pincer type FAI. One other test that's kind of useful for most any type of hip pathology, including FAI, is the log roll test. So the log roll test is having the patient lie flat on their back and turning their foot and ankle into internal and external rotation. What we're doing is basically seeing what happens when we take that femoral head and rub it up against a malshapen um, acetabulum or vice versa. One other test that a lot of patients with hip pathology won't like is the quadrant test. So the quadrant test works by having that patient lie on their back. We're going to bring their knee and hip to 90 degrees, and then we're going to roll their leg into adduction and abduction. And when we're doing that, we're seeing how tight is that capsule? Number one, are we lifting their pelvis off of the table early to tell us there's a tight capsule, and are we producing pain? If there's pain, there's a possibility of osteoarthritis or certainly FAI. Now radiographs are one of the things that can help us confirm this diagnosis, that we can see one of two or three things. One, we may see an elongated femoral head. So you see this neck is kind of filled in. This is very egg-shaped and that egg-shaped femoral head and neck is going to cause some impingement when we move that hip into flexion and adduction. The other thing that we might see is that the acetabular rim looks like it has developed some fingernails growing out from it. Here we have a pincer type FAI, and a lot of times we'll see both of those. And when we see both of those, or either one for an extended period of time, it starts to look like this. Where we see those morphologic abnormalities in both the acetabulum and in the femoral head, but we're also starting to see some osteoarthritis there, that long-standing FAI is going to cause almost an ossification of that acetabular labrum of the rim. Now, 82% of FAI cases are asymptomatic, but those that are symptomatic are much more likely to develop degeneration. So just because we have a structural abnormality in the area doesn't mean it's going to turn into osteoarthritis. But if it becomes symptomatic, then it's much more likely that we're going to see degeneration form secondary to that. As we'll see many times throughout this presentation, degeneration, the osteoarthritic spurs, are largely symptoms of something else that's going on. If there's one thing that we've learned in the past decade is that these structural problems, like an FAI, or a slap lesion, a rotator cuff tear, a meniscus, a lumbar disc bulge, are not always symptomatic. How many disc bulges have you seen that are asymptomatic? Tons of them. In fact, between a third and half the population has a lumbar disc bulge that's not symptomatic, they don't know it. In fact, 20% of the population has lumbar stenosis, a canal of the spine that's less than 10 millimeters, and they don't know it. So all of these things that are structural problems are themselves symptoms. Our goal is to address the underlying problem that led to that in the first place, and that's what we'll talk about in just a second. For FAI, what are we going to do for this patient in office? So what's, going, what, so what's our management going to look like? Well, number one, we're going to perform some, whoops, I'm going the wrong direction here. The first thing that we're going to do is work out the muscles that are excessively tight. And the first group is the adductors of the thigh that we're often going to develop trigger points in the mid portion of that muscle belly. So working those muscles out means applying our favorite technique, either a pin and stretch or a myofascial release to get some movement into that area. The other thing that we'll do is we'll work out the psoas, that any time that we have a hip or lumbar spine pathology, our hip flexors and trunk flexors like the psoas are going to tighten up. So the way that we'll work that is we can apply some ischemic pressure over the area, but we can also do a contract relax stretch. Where right now Dr. Steele is having Christy push her knee forward and then he stretches back. She pushes forward for seven seconds and stretches back, and by doing that, we get a good stretch of that iliopsoas, and if we can do that while we're stripping through the muscle, we'll get some, some squirming out of the patient because it's uncomfortable, but we'll get to release that. And I'll go through this exercise a little bit more carefully later. I'll also show you a website that you can review all of these videos right after the presentation. So if there's anything that I go through that you said, I wish you would have explained that a little more clearly or would have gone through that a couple of times, 
I'll give you that resource that you can take a look at that stretch of any of these stretches, exercises, or orthopedic tests that you can review them after the presentation. And I'd encourage you to do that. It'll help to reinforce the information to make it more usable on Monday morning. Two of the things that I love to do for these patients is to get some motion into that capsule. So number one, we can do axial hip distraction, which is as simple as having the supine patient lie relaxed as we gently traction their leg. And I like to do that in oscillatory fashion, where we give it a little traction, let go, a little traction, let go. Just in inducing some imbibition, inducing some, some flow of, uh, of fluids and nutrients back into that hip capsule. The other thing that these patients will often like is hip capsule mobilization. So the way that this works is the patient's in a prone position. I'm going to apply a uh, phenor contact over their acetabulum and apply a little downward pressure as I slightly extend their leg. Now I'm not moving it into internal or external rotation. We're keeping it neutral so we don't get a pinch, but then we're going to apply just a gentle oscillatory compression through that femoral head. That's a stretch that is really appreciated by osteoarthritis patients, and our FAI patients generally tolerate that well too. But we want to be careful about the internal external rotation because if we're leaning into them while we're doing that and we're getting some rotation of that femoral head, we're moving it into a pinch state, especially for a pincer type FAI, and they're not going to like that. So make sure you keep the, the hip neutral in this case. And then, like all of these musculoskeletal issues, we're going to send the patient home with homework. And that homework is going to be in the form of stability exercises for their hip and core. One of my favorite stability exercises for the, for the core is a side bridge. That in this case, we're having the patient lie on their side. She's doing a side bridge from the knee. Once that becomes easy, we can go to a side bridge all the way from the ankle. But she's keeping her body as though it's on a skewer in a midline here. One of the things we want to make sure is that she's not watching what she's doing. We want her neck in that same spine sparing position. So she should be looking straight ahead while she's doing that exercise. The other exercise that's helpful to build some strength is a dynamic wall squat. Simply having that patient move into a proper hip hinge to touch their butt against the wall and come back up. And when they're doing that, whether they're doing just the partial hip hinge here against the wall or we're teaching them how to get out of a chair, which so many of our hip pathology patients don't get up and down from a chair properly, this is the proper mechanics. You're thrusting forward from the hips and buttock to move your hip up forward. Imagine your hip is on a track here, a 45 degree rail, and now as she comes up, she's leading with her ASIS, as opposed to leaning forward and then walking herself up. She's letting her pelvis lead the way up from that hip hinge. So a proper hip hinge wall squat is something that's critical to teach our patients with FAI. The other considerations that we want is to make sure that that patient does stay physically active in spite of their discomfort. We want them to avoid those provocative positions, keep them out of the FADIR test as much as we can. We'll stretch um, the muscles that are appropriate, but stretching, this is one of those conditions where a lot of stretching is not overly helpful. FAI hips don't appreciate a whole lot of stretching, so we can do some light mobilization, but we're mainly going to focus on strengthening, so be very cautious with how much flexibility exercise we're prescribing for a patient with FAI. It can be counterproductive. And we don't want to be aggressive with our manipulation because that hip is not going to appreciate uh, getting pinched artificially. This is a, uh, a slide that I, I like. You look so much thinner, thanks. I had my appendix removed. So even when we're in a virtual classroom, you can't get away from the bad jokes. They're gonna, they're gonna come. But the other thing that I hope that you're getting from this, in addition to the bad jokes, is the clinical pearls, that our clinical pearls for FAI, we're going to see this commonly. Those morphologic abnormalities are usually bilateral. They're not always symptomatic bilaterally, usually symptomatic on one side. This patient um, is not going to like things that require flexion and hip rotation. The bear test is going to be positive for almost all hip pathology, except usually not in FAI. And if need be, we can take an MRI of the patient to rule out other types of problem, labral pathology, um, and that should be with an arthrogram to take a look at the labral pathology. But first, we'll always start, unless there's a history of trauma or another red flag, we'll always start with conservative management. And part of that conservative management involves addressing the functional deficits that could be perpetuating this problem. And I'm gonna cover one of my favorite functional deficits now. Hip abductor weakness is one of those functional deficits that contributes to so many of the problems that we see, not only downstream, but upstream as well. 
that our hip abductors are a group of several muscles whose stated job is to abduct the thigh. So those muscles in include the deep muscles, but most uh, essentially they include the gluteus medius. The gluteus medius comes off of the iliac crest and inserts down onto the greater trochanter, and when it contracts, it abducts the thigh. But in reality, that's not what it does the most. What it does the most is to keep, or more, is to keep our belt level when I stand on one leg. So when I pick up my left leg, my right gluteus medius tightens down to keep my belt level. If this muscle were weak, I would drop down toward that side as soon as, the, as, soon as I took the weight off of that left leg. But what it does even more than that is when I squat on that right leg, which I'll show you a video in just a second, if I'm squatting on one leg, this gluteus medius has to keep my knee out because as it's contracting, it's abducting my thigh, pulling my knee outward. If it's weak, it's going to let my knee dive inward, and that's a problem. So 70% of the abduction force required to maintain frontal plane alignment when we squat comes from the gluteus medius. It's by far the most important muscle in that process. So here's an example. This is my right gluteus medius. I'm standing on my, um, my right leg. If I pick up my left leg and this gluteus medius is incompetent, think of the spring being weak, it's going to let my pelvis drop. But the other thing that's going to happen is since it's not pulling as well on the greater trochanter, is it's allowing this right knee, my dependent knee, to go into uncontrolled adduction. Well, that puts a lot of stress on the whole chain. Let's take a look at this, this problem. That if my gluteus medius now is letting go, so this, this muscle is not doing its job on the right side, it's letting this thigh come into uncontrolled adduction. Imagine if I could take this spring here, the gluteus medius, and tighten it right now. If I could crank that down, what would happen? I would pull this femur outward. And if I loosened it, that femur would continue to dive inward. So that weak gluteus medius is letting that femur dive inward. Anytime that the, um, so when that happens, anytime that that gluteus medius lets the knee dive inward, that's obviously going to be putting stress on the ACL. That right now that uncontrolled adduction is stressing the medial collateral ligament and the ACL. Because any time that we go into adduction with the thigh, we also have to go into internal rotation. That one can't happen without the other. So when we're going into internal rotation, now we're torquing the ACL. And those two ligaments don't like that. One thing to prove our point on the gluteus medius contributing to ACL problems is there was a study several years ago that looked at soccer players. And by having the soccer team strengthen their gluteus medius with a couple of simple exercises that I'll show you in a minute, they were able to decrease their ACL injuries by a third that season. And that's a, that's a major league that was, was doing that study. So this is, a, this is a significant impact on the alignment of the knee that's coming from the hip. Our knee is largely a slave to what's happening at the hip and the foot. Most of the things that go wrong at the knee are symptomatic of something else, and this is certainly one of those cases. Now the other thing that's happening when my knee dives inward is the number one cause of knee pain, patellofemoral pain syndrome. So if my leg were lined up properly, let's take a look at this patient's left leg here. Basically I can draw a line through their quadricep, through their patella, and into their tibia. And because the backside of that patella is V-shaped, it likes to be on that line. If I kink that line like I'm doing on the right side here, that patella doesn't like it. So now what's happening is this line has a bend in it, which means that this center line is being pulled laterally. So my lateral femoral uh, condyle, my lateral patellar facet are rubbing against each other, which is a lateral tracking disorder of the patella or the number one cause of knee pain, patellofemoral pain syndrome or runner's knee. So our patients who have these patellofemoral issues largely are having that from the hip. We've in the past thought about strengthening the vastus medialis, that maybe that's a solution. That since this patella is riding laterally, let's pull it medially by strengthening this vastus medialis. Well, how strong does my vastus medialis need to be in order to line that back up? How about if I just straighten out my leg and it lines back off automatically? And that happens by strengthening the gluteus medius. So the other thing that happens in this chain, or one of the other things that happen, is when there's torque in the femur here, this internal rotation, 
Not all of that is absorbed by the knee, fortunately. Some of it gets transferred down into the tibia. And so now we get torque on the tibia. And that's where we develop shin splints. That shin splints or medial tibial traction periostitis means that we've had stress on that area for a long period of time. We used to think of this as just growing pains. Now we know that's not the case. We'll cover shin splints a little bit later today, uh, but, but uh, suffice it to say, this stress is one of those significant contributors to that process. The other thing that's happening is anytime my, my tibia is rolling inward, it's dumping my feet downward. So as this tibia rolls medially, I'm losing the arch of my foot. And when I lose the arch of my foot and stretch that out, now what do we have? Well, we have plantar fascia issues because that plantar fascia attaches from the calcaneus out onto the toes and it likes this nice shortened position when we artificially lengthen that because the arch of the foot has gone away. Now we're stretching the plantar fascia and it starts to scream at us too. The other people who don't like that process are the people who live on the inside of the medial malleolus, which would be the posterior tibial tendon and the posterior tibial nerve. And so when we stretch the posterior tibial tendon, anything that's stretched for a long period of time becomes hypoxic and irritable. And the same thing is true of the nerve. And when it's hypoxic and irritable, we develop tarsal tunnel syndrome, one of the other conditions that we'll talk about shortly. So all of these things that we're going to cover today are intimately related to the strength of the gluteus medius. When that muscle's weak, we have lots of bad things that happen. They don't all go down chain though. I know that we're talking about the lower extremity this weekend, but the other thing that happens when the gluteus medius is weak is we have up chain problems. That this internal rotation of the femur causes the pelvis to move because the greater trochanter is L-shaped. When that greater trochanter is thrown backwards, it throws my pelvis backwards and now for me to walk, I have to stand in hyperextension. So the lumbar facets are not fond of that hyperextension, so our lower back pain patients don't like that. When they have a weak gluteus medius, they have constant irritation of those L4-5 and L5-S1 facets, and that constant irritation makes them inflamed, makes them sticky, and makes them stuck. So we can adjust them repeatedly, or we can strengthen the gluteus medius, and it gives our outcomes a much better chance. That's where our value comes from, by getting better results with fewer treatments. And one of the biggest things that we can do for problems here down is to strengthen that gluteus medius. The complaints that our patients come into the office with are just the things we talked about, all the way from the lumbar and sacroiliac joints down through the foot and knee and the plantar fascia. And we'll talk about a lot of these conditions today. But before we talk about them, let's get a grasp on how do we identify if there's gluteus medius weakness. And what we're going to do is we're going to run the patient through a couple of functional maneuvers. We're going to see how do you perform when we challenge you with these tests. The first thing that we can do is statically look at that patient's knees. Do they have knock knees? Are they having uncontrolled adduction when they're standing? Now, I don't know about you, but for those of you who evaluate this, you probably don't see this very often. Most of the time, people's hips are competent enough to keep their legs lined up when they're on both feet and not causing any stress through bending and jumping and running. But when things start to fall apart is when we start to challenge that muscle. And one way we can challenge that muscle to double that patient's force, well, one thing that we can do is a Q angle measurement. The Q angle measurement is an invaluable test, or maybe I should say unvaluable. I've never done it in my office. It's interesting. The reason this slide is in here is because the Q angle, as we know it, runs through from the ASIS down through the center of the femur to uh, the patella, and then from the patella through the tibial tuberosity. And we know that when somebody has a wider pelvis, they're going to have a greater Q angle. When the Q angle increases, there's a higher likelihood for weakness and for the problems that we've talked about. So this problem, hip abductor weakness, is prevalent throughout society, but it's more prevalent in females. And one of the reasons is because there's a slightly wider hip base and a slightly greater Q angle because of that. So it's not surprising that females have a whole lot more issues when it comes to these lower chain problems, especially ACL injuries. If you've treated a high school girls soccer teams, you'll know how many ACL injuries happen. Tons of them, and yes, they happen in the males too, but the females are even more predisposed. The other thing that's interesting is that if we do an EMG study and say, what's the maximum voluntary contraction of the gluteus medius? A male can contract their gluteus medius with about 70% maximum voluntary contraction, and a female can contract it with about half that much. So whether that's the mechanical disadvantage of the Q angle, it's a chicken or an egg question, but we know that females are slightly more predisposed to these problems.
One of the things that we'll definitely want to take a look at is the Trendelenburg sign. So now we're going to up our challenge. First, we're just having that patient stand and say, do their knees come together with no stress? And then we're going to have that patient stand on one leg. And what we're looking for is what happens to their pelvis. When I stand on one leg, is this gluteus medius competent enough to hold me upright, or is it so weak that I'm gonna to dip to the side? That would be a positive Trendelenburg. But if I know that every time I lift my left leg, I'm going to drop to the left side, what am I going to do? I'm going to shift my center of mass so that I can get better balance. And that's called a compensated Trendelenburg. So this patient recognizes when they stand on their right leg, their right gluteus medius, this spring is going to let go unless they compensate by leaning over the top of that. So when we see a positive Trendelenburg, we know the patient has gluteus medius weakness. When we see this patient has a, a compensated Trendelenburg, we know that they've had gluteus medius weakness for a long period of time. Now sometimes our patients will have a little bit of trouble standing on one leg or doing some of these movements. One other test that we can do is the modified Trendelenburg, which is simply asking that patient to hike one hip, lift that leg, straight leg off of the floor a couple of inches, and they should be able to hold that for 30 seconds without any trouble. If that patient starts to get to 5, 10, 15 seconds and they're struggling, they're trying to balance, we know that that's a weak gluteus medius that's not able to hold that contraction and shift their pelvis up over the top. But my favorite test for this is a functional squat, saying what happens when we ask that patient to squat? So what we're looking for here is can that patient maintain frontal plane alignment or are we going to see signs of hip abductor weakness? So let's take a look at what those signs are. That in this static picture, let's, um, let's, let's take a look at Christy on the, on the uh, viewing left side here. And what we're going to see is she stands on her right leg and lifts her left leg. If her right gluteus medius, if this spring is incompetent, it lets her pelvis drop. We might see some compensation with that as well. But what we'll also see is this spring is letting go not just of the top at the iliac crest, it's letting go of its bottom attachment at the greater trochanter, so we see those thighs dive inward. And when the thigh dives inward, the knee is diving inward here, we're very suspicious of some incompetence of the gluteus medius. So now let's watch this in a, uh, a video. And I'll encourage you to first watch um, the, uh, Dr. Steele on the viewing right side here. When he stands on one leg, his pelvis stays level. When he does a two leg squat, his knees stay apart. When he does a single leg squat, his leg comes straight at us like the crease of his pants. And when we have him do a six inch step down, the, the patient is going to be able to do that without a lot of shaking and without a lot of hyperpronation. Now let's watch Christy on the opposite side perform the same test. When she stands on one leg, she's got this Trendelenburg going on. When she squats, her knees dive together. Now she faked those two because her hips aren't that weak, but this is real now. When she stands on one leg, did you see the instability, the wobbling and the knee diving inward? I'll play this in slow motion in just a second so you can get a better view, but watch what's happening here with that six inch step down. The patient has all sorts of wobble. Let's, let's take a look at real time once more. A single leg squat, there's the Trendelenburg. A double leg squat, her knees come together as opposed to staying apart. A single leg squat, the patient is going to have instability. She's shaking and her knee dove inward is the big telltale sign. And on a six inch uh, step down, let's watch her foot. All of those compensations that are happening at the ankle. So anytime that functionally, one muscle's not doing its job, the good news is there are other tissues throughout the body that will pick up the slack. Unfortunately, those tissues usually weren't made to pick up the slack. So now we're going to have problems with those tissues. We're going to have dysfunction and eventually degeneration and failure of those tissues. I promised I'd play in, in slow motion. So let's do that now. Let's watch Christy on a single leg squat. And she picks up one leg as she goes to squat. Look what's happening to the instability in her knee. Look at that knee dive inward as opposed to this knee that's staying straight at you. One more time, watch her knee in particular. Watch it dive inward as she squats, boom. That diving inward is putting stress on the ACL, it's putting stress on the MCL, it's misaligning the patella, it's torquing the tibia, it's torquing the femur, it's causing a stretch of the plantar fascia, it's causing a antiversion of the pelvis with the excessive uh, hyperextension in the lumbar spine, 
And all of those complaints are related to that simple process of the hip abductors letting go. So what we're looking for is pelvic drop. Did we see a Trendelenburg? Do we see their thigh rotate? But especially, do we see their knees come together? Is there adduction? Is their knee buckling? Is there any instability that if the patient is doing this when they're performing their single leg squat, they've already failed the test. They're not able to even balance on one leg, much less squat without having to, to recruit all sorts of compensatory muscles. And then we'll also look for what's happening in the arch of their foot. I like to do this barefoot. As part of an overall functional exam, I'll test the hip abductors, then I'll have them walk to test their, um, their hyperpronation or ability to stay in a neutral position. And so we're looking for any of these mechanical signs that something is going on in the hip itself. Some of the other tests that we can do, sometimes a patient is just not a good candidate to squat. They've just had a knee replacement, a hip replacement. So we can do a sideline hip abduction in this patient where we put them on their side, have them bring their, their thigh up into abduction. And let's go through that one more. Bring their hip up and thigh up into abduction. And now we're simply going to push down on their ankle and see can they resist that process. If we see that the patient has problems, it means muscles have been overworked. And those muscles are probably going to be symptomatic, especially the gluteals, the hip ab, uh, adductors. Because remember when Christie's legs were, were shaking, moving in and out, trying to compensate, not only were the abductors, the gluteus medius, and also the iliotibial band firing, we were also getting a lot of firing of the adductor muscles. So that's going to develop trigger points as well. So the way that we'll work those out, we'll start with the gluteus maximus and gluteus medius. And that muscle is going to typically abduct the thigh and sometimes externally rotate it. And the way that we'll work is we can apply an ischemic compression to a trigger point in the area, but we can also do a pin and stretch. And I love the pin and stretch where we trap the trigger point and then have the patient bring their thigh up towards their chest. So Dr. Steele traps that trigger point that all of us are very familiar with. And the patient brings their knee towards their chest as he strips over the top of that. And again, if you want to review any of these videos um, of the releases, the assessments, or the exercises, I'll, I'll give you the resource that you can go ahead and review those, those videos along the way. The other tissue that's oftentimes going to be irritable in our patients with hip abductor weakness is the tensor fascia lata. That, remember we said 70% of the um, abduction force to maintain that frontal plane alignment comes from the gluteus medius. That means 30% comes from somebody else. And that somebody else is two muscles that attach onto the iliotibial band. The tensor fascia lata in the front and the gluteus maximus in the back. So the tensor fascia lata in the front and the gluteus maximus in the back. So when the uh, gluteus medius is not doing its job, those two are overworked. When they're overworked, those springs become tight. And those tight springs then put tension on the, the iliotibial band and cause problems not only where they compress the hip, but distally down at iliotibial band syndrome. So no surprise that we'll be discussing that later as well. The way that I like to work out the tensor fascia lata is again a pin and stretch, trapping that trigger point and then adducting that patient's thigh behind them. Now remember, anytime that we stretch or work the tensor fascia lata, like Dr. Steele's doing now, the leg has to go behind the other leg because that TFL is up front. So if I move that leg up front and try to stretch it or strip it, I'm going to have lots of slack in the muscle and it's not going to work. So in order to maintain tension, that leg has to be behind the opposite leg for any type of stretch or any type of stripping. The other muscles that will work out are the hip adductors, so the adductor magnus, adductor longus. Those are common trigger points in those muscles. I don't know if, they, if you've identified those frequently, but they're often hidden. In the patients who have hip and knee pain that we've looked at everything else, if we haven't looked at their adductors, that's probably where the, the problem lies. It's one that I frequently overlook because it's a big, big muscle, fairly durable for the most part, unless you have acute pain. But a lot of times it'll harbor those silent trigger points. The other muscle that almost anybody with problems here down has an issue with is the iliopsoas. So remember that comes off of the lower lumbar vertebra, comes over the iliopectineal eminence, and then inserts down onto the lesser trochanter of the femur. And in order to strip that muscle, we have to dig in deep to the medial AS, uh, uh, medial and deep to the ASIS and trap that trigger point as we take that leg into extension. And then we can do a contract relax as well.
And finally, the things that are most important for hip abductor strengthening our hip abductor rehabilitation is strengthening the muscle to get it to become competent once more one more time so that it doesn't let go too easily. And the way that we'll do that is a, a couple of different exercises. Number one, a posterior lunge is really useful. In this case, the patient is hanging on to a door frame or a, a bar on the wall or a rack at the gym, and they're doing a single leg squat. So that's the posterior lunge. Now, one thing that we don't want is we don't want that knee to come forward. The knee should stay relatively over the top of the foot here. It should not advance beyond the foot. If so, we're going to put excessive stress on the knee and we're not really using the gluteus medius to help us come back up as efficiently as we should. So remember, the patient is going to keep their, their knee over their uh, ankle, and when they come back up, they're leading with their hip. By hanging on to that door frame or to a post, they're able to help themselves up to retrain those mechanics. She's on a rail right here, and her hip should lead the way back up. It shouldn't be coming from her body bending forward, so she's hanging on and she's pulling herself, she's pushing herself back up with her gluteus as opposed to um, walking herself back up with her upper body or using her quads excessively. The other um, exercise or group of exercises that's really helpful are the clam exercises. So the clam exercise, really simple, we're going to have that patient, oops, oops, sorry about that, we're going to have that patient lie on their side and they're going to um, simply take their knees apart. So she's going to spread her knees, put them back together, spread her knees, put them back together. When a clam becomes easy, we can advance to a clam with a band. So now she's doing the same exercise, but she's uh, tied an elastic band around her knees to provide some additional resistance. This is very little stress on a patient with knee problems or with hip problems, but it's a significant strengthening tool for that gluteus medius. The other strengthening tool that we want to give that patient is a side plank with abduction. Now, if we look at the literature, there's four exercises that are most potent to strengthen the gluteus medius. It's a, um, it's an, a side plank with abduction is number one. So if I'm lying on my side, I get into a plank and then I abduct my thigh, I'm strengthening the top side. That's the number one exercise. But it's also strengthening the downside that that downside is the number two exercise for the downside muscle. The third exercise is an advanced clam, which I'll show you in a second. And then the fourth is the posterior lunge that we did before. So you would say, why don't we just jump into the most effective exercises? It's because somebody who has gluteus medius weakness is very unlikely to be able to perform a side plank with abduction properly. So they'll get the job done the same way that we can compensate for most any deficit but it's not going to happen well. And so we're teaching that patient bad form and reinforcing bad form. It's kind of like having Shaq practice free throws on his own. You're gonna get the same crappy outcome, except now we have stronger muscles doing a bad job, and that's exactly what we don't want. So in order to prevent that, we'll give that patient a challenge they can handle. Start them with a clam, advance to a clam with a band, and then before we can even think about getting them into a side plank with abduction, for the majority of patients, we're going to teach them first how to do a side bridge. Go into a plank, drop back down onto the table. As she drops back down, she'll be in a slightly fetal position, and now she'll come back up into that straight plank, and again, she should have her neck looking straight forward in this case, so there's just a perfect line going down. Once the patient is able to show you that they can do a full side bridge properly, then we could consider moving them to a side plank with abduction. So in this case, she's going up into the full plank position, and moving her thigh up into abduction. That's a very challenging exercise that again, we have to monitor to make sure the patient is performing it properly, not just performing it. There's a big difference between doing an exercise and doing an exercise well. The other exercise that we'll challenge that patient with is the advanced clam. So in this case, both her knees and her ankles are spread about 12 feet, and she's simply going to allow her leg to move into internal rotation and then back up into, uh, into, into internal rotation. So she's taking her ankle down and then moving it back up again, down and back up again. And this exercise looks fairly simple. If you think that it's simple uh, and haven't done this exercise, I'd encourage you to try about 15 of them this evening and tomorrow. You'll definitely know where your gluteus medius is. This is a challenging exercise. In fact, it's one of the most challenging exercises and one that we can move our patients into fairly quickly once they've got the clam exercise down. The other things that we want to think about for our patients with hip abductor weakness 
is we don't want to put them in a chronic stretch position. So that chronic stretch position of having them hang on one hip when they're standing for prolonged periods of time, having them sit with a cross-legged gait, or even sleeping in a sideline position. So if they're sleeping in a sideline position, we're going to be getting a stretch of that gluteus medius. And any muscle that's stretched for a prolonged period of time is not going to be a happy muscle. So we want to put a pillow in between their knees or keep them off of their sides altogether. The other thing that can be helpful is many times hyperpronation of the foot and hip abductor weakness are biomechanical co-conspirators. So we have to address both of them. If this patient, if you see their arches dropping away as soon as they walk down your hall, then we're probably going to either have to teach them how to strengthen the muscles that hold their arch up or get them into an orthotic or at least an arch support. And if they're carrying too many pounds, they're going to be grateful to drop a few of those. If you've ever hiked with a backpack on or carried some, some blocks throughout the day to build a wall or whatever it may be, you know how much your knees and hips pay a price from that process. Same thing's true with a few extra pounds, especially when that's anterior, accentuating the hyperlordosis of the lumbar spine, which is doing just the opposite down into the legs, throwing those thighs into internal rotation, putting more torque on the knees. So getting that patient to lose a few pounds can make a huge difference. What's the ICD-10 code for somebody with hip abductor weakness? There is none. But I found that if I don't use this diagnosis and if I don't address that diagnosis, I get to use these diagnoses a whole lot more, which is bad because my V-score went down. So I hope this presentation on hip abductor weakness has been beneficial. There's a few clinical pearls. Again, you can check out any of these videos to review them along the way at chiroup.com. You'll be able to log in if you're not a subscriber. Go to the free trial, click free trial, and you'll get to use that over the next couple of weeks to see what each of those videos look like and even prescribe them to your patients. So hopefully that presentation has provided some benefit and enriched your clinical practice on Monday morning.